good to see you. This morning, we're going to be in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10, and I've titled this message, The Door of the Sheep. And I invite with you this morning to turn to, cha- to John chapter 10 and look at verse 1, but maybe turn back a page as we're going to look at the conclusion of, of chapter 9 here in just a minute. But the illustration of shepherding in ancient Israel was a very similar concept. The shepherd was a, was a rugged individual. He had a sun bronzed face. He was weather beaten and he had hardened hands. Shepherds lived and worked outdoors and spent their time caring for their sheep. Shepherds had to be brave. They had to be heroic as it was required for them to fight off bears and lions and wolves in order to protect the flock they were in charge of. And it was the responsibility of the shepherd to provide for all the needs of his sheep. When the flock needed water, he would lead them beside still waters. When they needed food, he would guide them into green pastures. If they needed rest, he would lead them to a safe place to lie down. And when they needed sleep, he would bring them back into the sheepfold. The life of the shepherd was tied up entirely in the life of the sheep. And all the needs of the sheep were, were to be met by this shepherd. So as we, as we come to John chapter 10 this morning, it's not surprising to read Jesus say two times, I am the good shepherd. This image of the shepherd reveals so much about our Lord Jesus Christ. And like a shepherd in ancient times, Jesus was supremely devoted to the care of his sheep. It was his responsibility to oversee and to supply all the needs the sheep had. He must protect and provide for his sheep. He must lead and to feed his sheep. He must guard and guide them. And as we look at the context, not only does Jesus claim to be the good shepherd, but he also claims to be the door of the sheep. And so if you'll look with me in verse 1 of chapter 10, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so this morning, as we read this passage, I want us to first look at our point here. Is, our first point is look out for false shepherds. When Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but comes in another way as a thief and a robber. Verse 1, Jesus is making this emphatic assertion of this previous argument that was taking place in chapter 9. Jesus is addressing those Pharisees who excommunicated the man who was healed of his blindness. And we see that, that, that the Pharisees' behavior was like that of a thief and a robber to the people of God in the first century. So Jesus uses this culturally familiar vocation to describe what is going on spiritually in Israel. The same way that we use illustrations that are culturally culturally significant to us on the Gulf Coast. We may use a fishing or Mardi Gras or football illustrations. This is what Jesus would use uh, to communicate heavenly truth on on, on a very earthly uh, stage. So Jesus defines for us 
an important issue that shepherds and a sheep owner had to face. And that was a false shepherd. False shepherd, shepherds would climb the walls and enter illegally in order to steal or to slaughter the sheep who belonged to someone else. The door was the only entrance and exit for the sheepfold. And only those known by the gatekeeper would be allowed access. They needed proper credentials. They needed proper qualifications in order to have contact with the sheep. And here Jesus describes the false shepherds of Israel as being the Pharisees. And if you look in chapter 9 and verse 40, he says, Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. And so Jesus is responding to the, the, the false shepherds of his day being, being the Pharisees. And we see that these, these shepherds were not appointed by God. These were the self-righteous, the self-appointed shepherds of Israel. They attempted to, to take and to steal what belonged to God. In reality, the Pharisees, they claimed to know God, but they did not know God. They did they didn't care about the sheep. They only cared about their, their status in society. They would often trample down the sheep. They would also fleece the sheep and take advantage of them for sordid gain. And whenever there was a disagreement with the sheep, they would cast them aside where, just like they did this man who was healed of his blindness. And they hated Jesus. They hated the true shepherd because he exposed them for what they really were. Now, Jesus had been fighting these thieves and robbers throughout his entire earthly ministry. We see his first clash with them in John 2.13 when he cleansed the temple. It continued throughout even the Feast of Tabernacles, as we would see in John 7-9. through There was always this confrontation that Jesus would have with the Pharisees and the Sadducees of his day. But today for us, here in the 21st century, we must be aware that even today that there are false teachers that still exist in the church and in cults. And it would be naive of for us to think that every religious leader who stands in a pulpit or claims to speak from God is a true shepherd. Matthew 7, 15, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells those in attendance, he says, beware Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them. How? You will know them by their fruits. In Matthew 24, 11, it'll be this way until Christ returns. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. And so in stark contrast to the false shepherd, we see in verse 2 and 3, we see the true shepherd. And so if we look at verses 2 and 3 in chapter 10, he says, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And we see that this shepherd, this shepherd, the one who we are to embrace. And we are, this is, this is point two here, that we are called to embrace the true shepherd. We're to beware of false, look out for false shepherds, but embrace the true shepherd. And this is, this is what, we see in verses 2 and 3. This is the shepherd, the true owner of the sheep. He owns them because they have been entrusted to his care by God. He knows them, he loves them, and we see here that he is devoted to them. But regarding the shepherd, we see that he enters through the door, meaning he comes Lawfully, He's not like a thief or a robber who tries to scale the walls. He comes lawfully through the door. And this simple meaning of the door is that Christ presented himself to Israel 
in a lawful manner, in strict accord to Old Testament prophecy. The door that Jesus speaks of here is the lawful and legitimate appointed entrance into the sheepfold. If we were to come into the church and the doors were locked and we tried to crawl in through the windows or to come in through an air vent, that that would not be lawful entry into the church. We, we have to come through an appointed door. And so Jesus, as he comes into the nation of Israel, he comes lawfully as the shepherd. And Christ submitted himself to the conditions that were established in the Old Testament that were written concerning him. Every event from the virgin birth to his earthly ministry qualified him as the true shepherd and door to the sheep. As the true owner to the sheep, we see that he is recognized by the gatekeeper. In verse 3, he comes for his own sheep. He calls his own sheep. He calls them how? He calls them by name. He knows them individually. He receives them to himself. And then in the third part of verse 3 there, we see that he leads them out. And he has come for them. And when they come to him, he leads them out of this sheepfold. And what's even more important is that he cannot and he will not leave any of his sheep behind. In verse 4, it says, When he puts forth all his own, when he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them and the sheep Follow him for they what? They they know his voice. The sheep that Jesus is speaking of here, that John is writing of, are those who have been given to him by the Father from eternity past. In verse 29, it says, My Father who has given them to me is, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And not all of Israel, we have to understand this, that not all of Israel were elected by God to believe and be saved. In verse 26 in chapter 10, this is what Jesus says, But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. And the reason that they did not believe is because they were not all his sheep. And they were left in darkness like this man who was left blind from birth, they were spiritually blind and could not understand because they were, they were spiritually appraised or, or not, not in tune with what God was doing because of their spiritual blindness. And so they rejected Jesus. But we see that there are also sheep chosen by God among the Gentiles as well. I love this in verse 16. It says, I have other sheep which are not of this flock that I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. And these are those whom God has chosen among the Gentile nations for salvation. And if you pay attention to verse 16 very carefully, it says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in and they will listen to my voice. Do you, do you sense the, the divine necessity in this verse? And what's amazing is the fact that we are represented as sheep here underscores the fact that salvation is entirely by God's sovereign grace. If we look at sheep, we we begin to study their characteristics that they are wayward and get easily lost and find themselves in, in danger and sheep on their own cannot find their way. Isaiah 53, 6 gives this illustration as he's really talking about the human condition. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Sheep don't follow a a given path. They, they have to have direction. They have to have leadership. And so that's why they need a shepherd. The next key element in this imagery is the voice of the shepherd as he calls his own. The voice of the shepherd is the, 
inward call of the Holy Spirit that draws a person or a sheep in this context to believe. Sheep are are very attuned to their shepherd. They recognize their voice. Their ears and their heads will will, will perk up and they they will follow the voice of their shepherd. And for us as Christians, when we hear the voice of our God who created us and who has called us out of darkness and into light, when He calls, we will listen and we will hear His voice. And we hear His voice most readily through the the Word of God, what He has given us in these 66 books as we believe that they are inspired, that they are inerrant, that they are infallible words of truth. And when we hear His voice, we find delight and pleasure in following Him. But this is one of the characteristics is that the sheep... Those who are true followers of Jesus Christ, they hear His voice and then they follow Him. The voice, as I said, is that the voice of the shepherd is that inward call of the Holy Spirit that draws a sheep to believe. And when the shepherd returns to his flock and he approaches the doorkeeper, he identifies himself and then is allowed to walk into the sheepfold to call out, his own sheep. We see that in the Old Testament, especially as we look in, in one of these large pens that were, were made for housing sheep to protect them from predators and thieves, it might be many different shepherds who have brought their sheep into the sheepfold. But as the shepherd of that particular flock would walk up, he would call them. And they would hear his voice and then we would see the separation of the sheep. And so Jesus has his own and he calls them and he leads them out. And once the sheep come to the shepherd, as he stands at the door of the sheepfold, he leads them out into pasture. He cares for them. He does not only call them out to leave them where they are. He calls them into himself. And once they have come, he leads them out of the 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 greater sheepfold out of town, away from the city and into the green pastures beside the still waters, eventually to his own sheepfold where he will build out in the Judean countryside. So Jesus does this with his sheep. He brings us out of desolate places. He brings us into his sheepfold And he is preparing a place for us in heaven where we will all gather as one flock together for all eternity. And so as you have maybe heard the call of God on your life and felt this inward call, if you have truly repented of your sins and have come to faith in Christ, you are one of the Lord's sheep and he is leading you as well. Christ is continually, moment by moment, leading His sheep. And we know, as I said earlier, Christ leads you by His Word. In Psalm 119.10, He says, Your Word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. But not only through His Word, but He also leads us. Christ also leads us by His Spirit. In Romans 8.14, As many are as led by the Spirit of God, those are the sons of God. And so if you are led by the Spirit of God, you can have full confidence in knowing that you are a son and a daughter of the King. And so as the shepherd leads his flock away from the sheepfold through the streets of town out to the surrounding countryside, many other voices will call out to the sheep. Many other voices will call out to the flock, trying to draw the sheep away. And so thirdly, I want us to see that we must avoid those with strange voices. In verse 5, John writes, A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Strangers. 
Parents, don't we, don't we teach our children this? Stranger danger, right? We teach our children that don't, don't talk to strangers. Don't talk to someone who you don't know or mommy and daddy don't know. And the same is, is, is true with the sheep. We, we have to be careful who we listen to. But the application here and the imagery that Jesus is using, we understand that, that a sheep that is bound to his shepherd will not simply leave their shepherd for another. They will not follow the voice of a strange shepherd. In fact, they will, they will run away. Sheep are timid creatures. They will run away from a strange voice. And this is precisely what happened in John chapter 9. In the healing of this blind man, you see him unresponsive to the voices of the Pharisees. Although not yet brought to faith in Christ, that occurs we see at the end of chapter 9, he is already refusing and fleeing from those false shepherds. The same is true today. That when the voices of strangers call out to the flock, they will simply not follow them. And that's my encouragement to you, church, is that when we hear false teaching on TV or the radio, that we'll turn it off. That we will have discerning minds and, and hearts that are attuned with the Holy Spirit and that we know what the Word of God says. We'll be able to quickly say, this is error or this is truth. That this is a, a, a shepherd appointed by God or this is a, a false shepherd who is simply trying to, to fleece the flock and take advantage of them. And so we have to be careful. We see voices of today, modern apostates, cult leaders, liberal preachers call out to the sheep. Those who are truly called of God, they're not going to respond. But we see that the voice of Joseph Smith, the, the leader and the founder of the Latter-day Saints and the Mormons, that, my people, is a voice of a stranger. The voice of Joel Olstein is a stranger. The voice of Paula White and Benny Hinn, those are voices of a stranger. And we have to reject them. We have to say that that is not the true gospel. And we need to be discerning in what we hear and what we allow to come into our hearts and minds. And again, if we see someone in our family, if we see a neighbor or someone at work following the voices of one of these strangers, it reveals that they are either sadly deceived and ill-equipped or they are not one of the Lord's sheep. And so we have to pursue them. We have to go after them and lead them into the true flock and to preach the true gospel so that they would understand the, the difference between truth and error. And so we have to avoid those with strange voices. In verse 6, it says, This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. And so like a parable, we, we, we know Jesus spoke in parabolic language. He would use a shepherding illustration or a uh, agricultural parable to, to teach his people heavenly truths. But it was also used to veil these truths from the Pharisees. And so in verses 7 and following, he, he speaks to his people with, with greater clarity. And he says in verse 7, So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And so, fourthly, we see that we, we have to enter through Christ. If Jesus says that He is the door, then, then in order to come into the sheepfold, we must enter through Christ. And so, here, Jesus says he alone is the door of the sheep. There's, there's no other door. There's no other access. And the image here is that in ancient times where shepherds would sleep, they would, they would sleep across the door, the entrance into the sheepfold. That they would be the first line of defense for the sheep. 
so that someone would have to literally step over them in order to get into the sheepfold. They would become the actual door or the gate. And the sheep would have to pass through him in order to get into the fold. There was no other access into the fold but through the door. And so it is with Jesus, him being the door of the sheep. He alone is the entrance into the kingdom of God. He alone provides access into the sheepfold of salvation. And when he says emphatically, I am the door, he is not simply not a door, not one of many doors, but he is the only door. And Jesus is asserting that he alone is the true door of the sheep that leads to salvation. And there's no, there's simply no other entrance. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We see here the exclusivity of Jesus, meaning that there is, there is no other way to come into the fold of salvation. It is only through Christ and Christ alone. In verse 8, he says, all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. And we recognize that these are the false religions. These are the false leaders of Israel, the Pharisees and the chief priests. They were the false shepherds who stole from the people rather than providing for them. They were the ones who were trying by means of intimidation to steal the people and to gain honor for themselves. But the sheep, they did not hear their voice. They did not respond to those who were trying to fleece them. The sheep responded to the voice of the true shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus points this out so that they would know and see a stark contrast between the way Jesus led them and the way the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious of that day were leading them. In verse 9, again, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And so Jesus repeats this I am statement for effect, emphasizing that there is no other entrance, there is no other way into the kingdom, and that He is the only way into God's salvation and forgiveness. When He says, if anyone enters through me, what that really means, if we were to really apply spiritual doctrine and theology to that, it really means to repent and believe in Christ. Repent of their sin, to deny themselves, to take up one's cross and, and follow Him daily. And what Jesus is saying is this, it's, it's not enough to acknowledge the existence of the door. It's not enough to admire the beauty of the door. It's not enough to observe others going in and out through the door. And it's not enough to want to go through the door yourself. You must actually take a pivotal step of faith and actually enter through the door. We can't get into heaven by keeping our toes at the threshold of the door without ever entering in. And that Entering in is through faith, believing that Jesus is who He says He is, and through repentance, turning from our sin and walking in righteousness and holiness according to His Word. This is what Jesus called for at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. He commands, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the, way that, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And that command, enter, is, is for us to take that pivotal step, as I mentioned earlier, in faith, to trust in Christ and to pursue Him. In Luke 13, 24, it says, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek and enter and will not be able 
That idea of striving is agonizing and pushing through the crowd and, and, and doing what we can to enter through. Because we know that the world is doing everything it can to hinder us. And we must cast aside every encumbrance. We must put aside every entanglement as we pursue after Christ. But we are called to pursue long after Him as He has called us out of the sheepfold and into His own flock. And here's what He says. I love this. I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, by me, excuse me, he will be saved. He will be saved. If anyone enters through Christ, he will be preserved from danger. He will be delivered from harm. He will be saved from sin, the final judgment, hell, condemnation the weeping and gnashing of teeth, and he'll be saved from outer darkness. As we think about the glories of salvation and the benefits of salvation, if we are faithful to enter according to his word and according to his prescribed way, there is, there is blessing and there is salvation. And so I ask you this morning, have you entered through the door? Who is Christ? Have you come to Christ on His terms, not on your own? Have you taken that decisive step of saving faith and entered through Him? And not tried to sneak in through the back door or come in through another way? Have you truly come to faith in Christ? I love this imagery that he gives. It says he will go in and out and will find pasture. And the imagery shows a twofold benefit. That in Christ, believers, those who are believers in Christ, both have protection and provision. When the sheep would go into the sheepfold, they would be protected from the wolves and the thieves and the robbers. And in the same way that God protects us, not allowing anything to, to harm us, we also see that He provides for us. I love Job 10, or excuse me, Job chapter 1, verse 10. He says, A hedge of protection about Him and His house is all that He has on every side. And, and, and we see that God protected Job. But God removed that protection for a season and allowed tribulation and distress and famine and difficulty and health issues test him. Now, did God give Job up to Satan? No, but he allowed him to be tested. And we see that even in Psalm 34, 7, it says the Lord, excuse me, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And so we see that the Lord will protect his own, even in the midst of trial and famine and persecution. And so these are the ones as when they, when they come into the sheepfold, they find protection. But also we see that these sheep will go out each morning and they'll find pasture. Palestine was and is a barren land for most, you know, for the most part. And, and good pasture, good grazing land was, was hard to come by. And it was something that the shepherd had to lead his sheep to. In Psalm 23, in verse 2, it says, gives the role of the shepherd. And this is, as David writes, the Lord is my shepherd. And here's the, the imagery that it gives us. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. It was the shepherd's responsibility to lead the sheep into a place of contentment, a place of peace and of satisfaction. Satisfaction. 
And so for those of you who have been walking with Christ for years and maybe even decades, do you know this deep contentment and satisfaction found in Christ alone? For, for many of you who are younger believers, you may be struggling with life's decisions. You may be having struggles as you're trying to understand the Word of God and see how these things apply to your life. But, but are you finding deep contentment and satisfaction in Christ? I know right now it is, it is difficult in the world we live in to find contentment and satisfaction in anything for any given amount of time. For we are a consumer-minded people and we always feel like we have to be gratified by something. But I want to challenge you to, to spend time in the Word daily. To spend time in prayer and, and find your joy, find your satisfaction and contentment in Christ alone. And look to Him as a shepherd. Look to Him as one who not only protects you, but also provides for you. Because as you do that, you are, you are leaning heavy upon Him and you are finding your dependency not in your own strength, not in your own ability, but you're finding strength in Him alone. And so I challenge you in that. As we come to a close here, I want us to look at verse 10. And unlike Christ, the false teachers in Israel have nothing to offer but death and destruction. Verse 10. And this is why I want you to find satisfaction and contentment and joy in Christ alone. Because you won't find that with the thief and his motives. The thief, in verse 10, comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I came, Jesus came, that they may have life and have it abundantly. The false shepherds have only come to take and steal from the sheep. They have nothing to provide, nothing to give. They only come to steal. But Jesus has come to give the sheep life. He has come to give them life abundantly. And again, having something abundantly means to have something in, in great measure. Or beyond that which is necessary. The, the spiritual pasture will always contain more nourishment than the sheep will make use of. There's an abundance. It's to have a surplus. To have more than enough. This abundant life is, is not a life free of sorrow or sickness. Nor from trials and tribulations. It's, it's not a life that is easy. Nor where everything is just wonderful. But it's a contented life of having all of our needs met in Christ alone. And so as we conclude today, have you heard the voice of the shepherd calling you? To hear Christ's call is not the same as responding to some emotional pressure of an evangelistic service or, or agreeing to be a member of a church. It is hearing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and then hearing the inner witness of your soul testifying that you believe these things are true. It is realizing that maybe for the first time you believe what the Bible says is true. It's realizing that you are a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. And so if you are hearing Christ's call in your life. You, you must respond to Him. For today is the day of salvation. Do not harden your heart, but turn to Him. Do not be slow in responding to the shepherd's call. I encourage you to come to Him, believe in Him, and entrust yourself to Him. And as you do that, that you would embrace Him and follow Him all the days of your life. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and this time to come and to hear from your word. Lord, what a great encouragement it is to hear from John's gospel about how your son is the door of the sheep. 
and how you have him protect us and provide for us all the days of our lives. Father, I pray that we would find great confidence and encouragement in these truths, that you would help us to understand and apply what we have learned today so that we would find joy and satisfaction and contentment, not in the things of this world, but in Christ alone. Father, we we love you. Father, I thank you for this church family. And I know that we are desiring to gather together. I know, Father, that there has been a season where we have been separate. But Lord, I pray that you would continually knit our hearts together. Keep us unified. Help us to be the body of Christ, even in our homes. Father, we thank you. We love you and we give you the praise for all you're doing. For Lord, you're in the heavens. You do as you please. And we know that you have a plan and a purpose for all things. We love you. We trust you. And we pray these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Church family, it's a pleasure to share God's word with you this morning. And I pray that you have a wonderful week. And I look forward to the next time we're able to get together. God bless.